Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Mail Bonding, the podcast where we look back at the James Bond films to see if they stand the test of time. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are two men who love James Bond films, just not necessarily the Roger Moore ones. First, he's the author of Duty on Our Empire, a 25th century love story, Chris Haley. Hey, I'll fly a ship out of... Ah, I screwed up. I'll fly a jet out of any ass for this podcast. Also with us is a youngest member of our group, Matt Palmer. Do I look as old as I feel, or is that just the Roger Moore wearing on me? I, I think it's the Roger Moore wearing on you. You definitely look older when I see you in high definition, though. <laughs> and this month we're reviewing 1983's Octopussy, the next James, official James Bond film and the sixth film starring Roger Moore well over the hill at this point in time. I think they named it Octopussy because he was an octogenarian. Yeah, we made that joke in lunchtime movie review before, so that was <laughs> shit. <laughs> All right, Matt, do you have a summary of Octopussy for us? I do. All right, let's hear it. Can British. you put it in your in your Jimmy Stewart voice because I feel that would be appropriate. <laughs> Can you tell me a story? British secret agent 009 is killed for being a clown. He was holding a forgery of a Fabergé egg. It appears the Russians are selling state jewelry at auction in England. Bond is sent to investigate. This leads him to India, where Bond tracks an exiled Afghan prince, Kamal Khan. Bond boinks one of Khan's henchbrods, Magda, and she steals the Fabergé egg from him. Bond, however, placed a tracking and listening device in the egg, knowing Magda would steal it. Khan, however, is not his own man. He works for a mysterious villain on an island fortress. This villain is called Octopussy. Khan's bodyguard, Gobinda, kidnaps Bond and holds him hostage in Khan's palace. Meanwhile, Bond escapes Khan's palace and listens to Khan on the device in the egg. He learns that Khan is working with a rogue Russian general, Orlov, to smuggle jewelry out of Russia and sell it in London. Khan uses Octopussy's circus troupe to smuggle the jewels from East Germany into the West. Bond smuggles himself into the circus and discovers that Orlov replaced the smuggled jewels with a nuclear bomb. Orlov wants to detonate the bomb on an American Air Force base so that NATO thinks one of theirs went off by mistake and will disarm unilaterally so the Russians can invade. But Bond never lets things go off by mistake, so he leaps into action. <laughs> Bond chases the circus train to the base and evades the cops by dressing as a clown. He rushes into the tent and disarms the bomb just in time to get a hearty thank you from the American general. Khan escapes and kidnaps Octopussy. When the Carnies chase him from his palace, Bond hops aboard Khan's plane and forces it down, just in time to get a hearty thank you from Magna. Yay! Which thank you was more hearty? The general's Magda's. Or... Okay. Just checking. All right. And that thunder is for, not for dramatic effect. We're just having a storm here. So. I thought I heard a thunderball at one point. Yeah, that's what it was. Thunderballs going off outside. All right. Octopussy released on June 10th of 1983, a rare summer release for the Bond franchise, grossed over $67 million in its time, which made it the ninth highest grossing. Um, uh, that's $67 million U.S., uh, which made it the ninth highest grossing Bond film behind Moonraker and ahead of Thunderball. Uh, worldwide, it made over $187 million. Uh, adjusting the U.S. gross for inflation, that would be about $175 million today, which actually makes it drop to the 14th highest grossing film behind Quantum of Solace and right above Spy Who Loved Me. It is the 13th official James Bond film, so we're well past the halfway point in the official James Bond film series. And the sixth film with Roger Moore, who was well past his prime in this. It's based on the 14th and final Ian Fleming novel, which was a book of short stories. And that is it for basic information on Octopussy. Chris, we have a song that does not contain Octopussy in the title. No, and could you really imagine a song with Octopussy in the title? I mean, what really rhymes? I mean, other than Kanye West, I don't think anybody could do it. And <laughs> Kanye wasn't even a gleam in Twitter's eye at that point. That's true. But as you said, this um, this uh, did have a... So it had a theme song without the title of the movie in it. It was an all-time high, sung by everybody's favorite. I know uh, Matt has said many times how much he loves Rita Coolidge. And, uh, I mean, really, how can you not? It was um, John Barry's return. Uh, he did not 
do the theme for for your eyes for for your eyes only, and he pretty we'll much one of those fours out. Yeah, there, there's four too many. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of felt that this was a lot like Carly Simon's uh, theme song in um, The Spy Who Loved, it, Loved Me, Nobody Does It Better, which also didn't really... I mean, there was a line in it that said Spy Who Loved Me, but I think that was just thrown in at the last second. So I don't know if you guys got that feeling for this theme song. Yeah. No, I thought I, I, you could hear echoes of it. Yeah, I, I could see echoes of it, but I like the the uh, Nobody Does It Better far better than All Time High. Yeah, I do too. And um, what I thought was interesting was the previous one was For Your Eyes Only, which uh, this was basically a music video. And this is this theme song really is like your father's song. It, it's not a hip music or, or a hip song that you would use in a music video, I don't think. <laughs> As the thunder goes That's off again. That's foreboding. <laughs> Well, somebody disagrees with me. Apparently. Yeah. Well, one thing I do appreciate, it is a song that does not does not force an awkward movie title into the main chorus for some reason. And and I, and I I would dare say Octopussy would be downright impossible to include in a lyric of a song without making the song not radio playable. Yeah. You there and yeah, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, as as far as the as far as the score for this, it didn't really stand out to me. I was trying to think of um, really. It, this was mainly set in India, but does it really have Indian type music? Not really. I mean, it, it's it's got more of a classical orchestra kind of uh, soundtrack to it, and composed by John Barry. That I I, I don't think it gives a flavor to the the uh, the landscapes that he visits throughout the course of the film other than some somewhat little jungle drums when he's being chased by uh Khan on the elephants and everything like that and um VJ his little indian accomplice or cohort he did play the little i don't know what that indian flute thing is but he did play the James Bond theme song yeah briefly so that that's that was the only music really that stood out to me in this uh, so, do you not like the all-time high song, Chris? I, I do like it. I mean, it's one of the James Bond songs that definitely sticks out to me. I still think it sounds too much like Carly Simon, Nobody Does It Better. And to be quite honest, uh, nobody really does do it better than her for for this uh, theme song. So, I think it's only average. I, I, don't, I don't think it stands out, but I don't dislike it. Matt, what did you think of the, the theme song, All-Time High? I, I thought it was another pretty forgettable one. Re- remember, I'm the guy who didn't like the Carly Simon one. Oh, so how could fact, I forget that? Yeah. Um, I think many people do it better. And so the fact that it kind of reminded me of that one means it, it's not going to be very high on my list. This is kind of a weird mixture for me is that I like the Nobody Does It Better, but I do agree with you. This one seems very uh, similar and I don't like this one nearly as much. I don't hate it. I don't absolutely hate the song, but it just, I always, I always, I usually forget that this is the theme song to a James Bond film. I mean, I remember hearing it at the time, but it's just, it's just, it's Muzak. It's so, you know, eighties adult contemporary type of uh, material that you, it, it just doesn't stick out, especially when you think of, Nobody does it better. Live and let die, and then following this, a view to a kill. That they just, this just seems so out of place. It just at this point, they almost took a step back. And I, I know Bond was aging. I know Roger Moore was aging, but this seemed to be like, well, this is going to be a throwback for a lot of the our, our older fans out there. We're not going to try to go with the hippest band, a hippest uh, person or singer or band around right now. But I do like the soundtrack uh, by John Barry. I always like John Barry soundtracks. I think he does a good job with them generally. The soundtrack was good. I, I thought it was a good one. Yeah, I th- I thought it complemented the film very well, and it didn't it, it didn't really have uh, too much of a kind of an Indian theme to it. But as far as the music, but I didn't think it was distracting. Like the music was out of place. If you would have, if you had pulled some of like the uh, 
uh, electronic kind of funk music they do in like Goldeneye about a decade later or so, um, it would have been woefully out of place in this film. And, and even kind of the, the disco kind of funk of Moonraker and a little bit that was in For Your Eyes Only would have been a little bit out of place. This seemed, this seemed very much like your, your grandma and grandpa's James Bond film. Is the best way I can describe it. Yeah, it was pretty much state of the formula, sort of composing, I guess you could say. Yeah. What about gadgets and action sequences, Matt? I, uh, it seemed like they were really pushing the the product placement a little heavier in this movie than we normally would, and I thought at times it even kind of limited their um, the coolness of their gadgets. You know, he had that watch with the brand name just kind of plastered on it. <laughs> and it was still kind of stuck in early 80s technology. And I can't, you know, can't tell if that was supposed to kind of be cool, you know, like, wow. But it looked like a, just like a digital watch to me. Um, and if you're supposed to be stealthy, should it be making that loud beeping yeah. noise so that all your enemies can hear it? <laughs> yeah. I, I also don't know if you guys notice when he's hiding in the um, gorilla suit. And they set the the nuclear bomb. Okay, it is you know whatever eleven o'clock, and the gorilla looks up to check its watch. I'm like what? Which reminds me, there was a gorilla suit. Um, <laughs> I thought that the the flying the flying car. They had a couple of kind of cool cool gadgets here. Number one was the one that that fit up the horse's butt for the opening sequence, <laughs> which by the way was probably the worst opening Bond sequence that we've seen yet. And then he had his um his uh, alligator boat disguise which was pretty which was pretty good and how I'm did missing- they do that by the way was he like floating like on his belly or was he standing and walking in that do you guys know i have no idea how it was shot obviously he was in it but i i had i'd be shocked if he was on his belly because if that started to if that started to take on water roger moore would have drowned in like 30 yeah. seconds and then um I'm, I'm missing one of his cool um traveling machines which which one am i forgetting well how could you forget the high-tech uh air balloon uh hot air balloon at the end of the film <laughs> yeah. with q with as q. a kid that cracked me up and to this day it still cracks me up i'm like how stealthy can you be with the big union jack flying in <laughs> very inconspicuous <laughs> never would be seen by the enemy approaching the palace and it just so slowly drifts its way over into the melee um of course, we had uh, everything that comes with carnies. We had a, a, a man being shot out of a cannon. We had a nuclear bomb being smuggled across across borders. We have a tiny microchip being um, just kind of carelessly dropped into the false Fabergé egg. Or was it the real one? You know, that, that was kind of cool, but I kept thinking, well, what if somebody shakes it? You know, it's an egg. They just kind of plop it down in there. The, the scene with Q's lab was pretty good this time. I thought they had some fun stuff like the... Um, the door that when knocked springs open to to spike you to death. I thought that was kind of cool. Action sequences. We had our, our car chase. We had the um, the lovely um, chase scene on the motorcycle taxis where the guys got that that shotgun with the, the rounded edge, just just lighting up the the town as they drive around. That was um, a little more of an absurd chase scene, but I thought it it actually worked kind of well because it actually had a little bit of a a twist to it given how it's kind of in, in these little slow going motorcycles on crowded streets well that was a company car uh, bonds wasn't slow going remember no <laughs> that by uh, the way is one of my favorite um cheesy lines of all of the the bond films i will tell you where he's all we've got company that's okay we i got a company car it it just cracks me up we had the um the circus brawl towards the end there at the uh, at the the castle the the fortress I don't know what you want to call it the palace, which was entertaining if nothing else. You know a, a lot of it though, and you know I watched this this movie with some people. Roger Moore is just so old <laughs> that a lot of the fight sequences just don't work anymore. There was a scene where he kicked the guy in the shin and ran away. You know, I, I, they at least could have given him a cane with a sword blade in it or something, but the, his age really hurt a lot of the action sequences in this movie, and pretty much all of them with him in it. He was clearly old. 
Well, and one of the reasons I think they put them in clown makeup is to hide some of the wrinkles. And at least that you can't see that he looks that age and his hair looks like clown hair through most of the film because it doesn't look age appropriate for what he was. And he's so um, he's so rigid that whenever they they had to replace him with a double, it was just painfully obvious on screen that that was somebody 30 years younger than him. Yeah, I don't believe that Roger Moore could fall off a train and roll to his feet and not be injured. <laughs> I don't think Roger Moore could fall off a bed and roll to his feet and not be injured at the age he was at this particular point in time. He 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 looks incredibly dated and incredibly old for the role. And, and But one of the things I do like is at least they had a female counterpart to him that was somewhat more age-appropriate. Yeah, and we we looked up her age, the actress's age, when we were watching the movie, because I I would have guessed she was late forties. She was, I think, thirty eight when this movie was made. Wow, she did not age well. No, she did not. It, definitely a, a di- difference between this film and uh, Man with a Golden Gun, where she appeared before. I was kind of hoping they would end this movie with the two of them holding hands in different bathtubs. <laughs> Okay, so uh, a commercial for Cialis. So. <laughs> yes, that that is exact. I thought this movie was headed for a Cialis commercial. Well before Cialis's time. To Roger Moore's dismay. Uh, any other gadgets? Or how could you forget a oh, the yo-yo razor or yo-yo yo-yo saw yo-yo saw yeah. whatever the yo-yo saw and and I kept wondering like what does this guy do if he has to attack you like from the ground level. <laughs> you know, it seems like his whole shtick is undone if you just take a little bit of gravity away from him. It was it was a cool idea, but you know, like, does he get another guy to drag a ladder around with him, or you know, what? I think that was another Gillette product placement. Two <laughs> blades, one to we lift up the head and one to cut through. <laughs> I also kind of glossed over the train the train scene, uh, which was kind of cool. The 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 fight scene on the on the train you can't it's it's really hard to screw up a a fight on top of a train all right well then let's talk about some bond girls four all three of them i have four i put down four because there's one that is of note uh, obviously the main uh, main role is octopussy played by Maud adams uh she had previously appeared in the james bond film the man with the golden gun or where she got killed um but so she's playing a completely different character one thing I found interesting, and, and I think this is just kind of general to this film, 2006 Fandango named her character as one of the top 10 Bond girls of all time, Octopussy. In 2006, Entertainment Weekly ranked her as one of the 10 worst Bond girls of all time. But in 2008, Entertainment Weekly also named her as the best babe of the Roger Moore James Bond films. So take it for what it's worth. Worth And that, and. And that seems to be something that we'll probably talk about this more later about Octopussy, where you either love it or you hate it. And there seems to be no in between the other. uh, And of course, James Bond does sleep with Octopussy, uh, at least on a couple of occasions. Eight times. (laughs) I'm sorry. They said Octopussy is the best Bond babe. Uh, Best Bond babe of the Roger Moore James Bond films, which, of course, we still have one to go, but. That's that was what they said in 2008, but na- but named Octopussy as as the tenth worst James Bond girl in 2006. So I'm assuming the Bond girls and the other Roger Moore films were all in the b- bottom ten. Other, another Bond girl, uh, Magda, played by Christina Wayborn, uh, Miss Sweden, 1970. Bond does sleep with her. She's kind of the kind of uh, along with uh, Khan. Uh, She's uh, Kamal Khan that she kind of works for him, although she also works with Octopussy. Uh, the one that you guys probably don't think of a Bond girl, but I thought she was of note, uh, Penelope Smallbone, uh, played by Michaela Clavel. She's the new secretary that works with uh, Money Penny. And because her name is Smallbone, I thought she was at least worth a mention. Bond does not sleep with her, he, uh, at least on camera. I'm sure once he got back to the office. It- he was only slightly interested in her. <laughs> Bianca, who was works with him at the in the opening sequence of the film when he plays a Toro, uh, Tina Hudson. It is presu- I would presume he slept with her because they make that kind of inference of you know see you back at the hotel and stuff like that. 
but that's not actually shown on screen since he flies off in his little toy airplane uh, and she drives off in the car. So, uh, four Bond girls, although there's many girls that work for Octopussy, Bond doesn't really um, deal with them other than Magda. Uh, who is, and I think this is pretty obvious, who is the Bond girl in this film? I uh, count Magda more than Octopussy as the Bond girl. Really? And why? She's just kind of, she just kind of has more um, adventure in the movie, more action. You know, she's, Octopussy comes in really late. And I don't feel like she's very instrumental in the in the in the film as as much as Magda is. You know, she's the one out like stealing things and you know repelling off of balconies and stuff like that. So. I would say Octopussy is the main Bond girl. I couldn't stand Magda in this film. She was just boring to me. She would she seems like she's just dumb as a doornail to me, and uh, was just terrible in every way imaginable so i my mine is uh octopussy and i'm gonna agree with chris i think it's octopussy because one the film is called octopussy it's not called magda matt but besides that fact is that she's the central figure that everybody else is just rotating around you know kamal khan magda and even bond are just circling her and although she's not necessarily so much as a, a catalyst to get the action moving she's always somehow uh, involved tangentially at least as a tangent to whatever is going on on the screen and so i i think she's the main bond main bond girl in this film plus the fact that that she's the one who gets saved by bond at the end when it's you know she gets taken by kamal khan and that's another action sequence we didn't talk about matt is the whole plane sequence it, it was a ridiculous plane sequence, I thought. Two people yeah. fighting on the outside of a plane. I, I thought there was a, some pretty good stunts to that. That that was at least interesting and yeah. stunt-wise, but story-wise, I thought it was ridiculous. But yeah. Well, even stunt-wise, it was kind of ridiculous. It was, it was just a little too much for an old man to be out there on a plane in flight. Let me in! I've got to get in! <laughs> He catches death of pneumonia from the cold or something. I need my jello. So, Where's my tea? So, uh, uh, I believe I checked my bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, who is the most attractive of the Bond girls? Um, that's a pretty good question. I still think it's Octopussy, but this is a slight one. I thought uh, Magna had uh, a very good look to her. She just didn't have the personality to go with it. But I'm going to give the slight edge to Maud Adams and Octopussy. I got to say, this is the the least attractive bunch of Bond <laughs> girls we have seen yet. I was not impressed. Really. Wait till Grace Jones <laughs> and I Tanya mean, Roberts. I mean, I feel I feel like I'm picking the the tallest midget here. And if I had to pick one, it would probably be like rower number four or something like that. <laughs> but um, I'll, I, you know, if I have to pick one of the Bond girls, I would say Maude Adams. Uh, I'm going to go with Penelope Smallbone, but I'm going to agree with Matt that this is probably the worst group of Bond girls in all the Bond films. There's just nothing, nobody who really stands out. I do not think Magda is that attractive, Miss Sweden, 1970. She just has an odd look about her. She's got pretty eyes, but I've never found her overwhelming attractive. I found Maude Adams more attractive. I found Tina Hudson more attractive, who played Bianca. Um, Magda was my least, I thought the least attractive. So I went with Smallbone, which was Michaela Clavel that, you know, uh, she was pretty cute. She was cute. She she had a different look, and you know, although she was only on screen, so I'm going to say she's the most attractive. Just to be a little controversial, that small bone gets a vote from me. Yeah. All right, what about Bond kills, Chris? There wasn't a whole lot of killing going on, um, other than some brain cells at certain points in this. It was very uneventful. Bond had the most kills in this film. Villains really didn't kill a whole lot of people. For for villains, the two assass- assassins, Mishka and Grishka, uh, I don't know who killed him, uh, but they killed 009 with a knife to the back. There were two guys mysteriously dead in the freezer. I don't know what where I missed that. Where Do you guys know where they yeah, came from? They were the guys who carried the tray of jewels out to the helicopter, 
and oh. and they and then uh the uh oh god uh go gobinda kills them so that there's no witnesses to any of that okay huh. i missed that good catch i didn't catch that at all yeah uh, I've only seen this film about 20 times. So. Well, I think I've seen it as many times as you, but I don't think I've seen it since it went off the HBO loop in the 80s. So, And then the last one for the bad guys really is uh, VJ was sliced in, in two with the yo-yo saw. That was my favorite of my um, Bond sidekicks was, was VJ. I did like him a lot in this film. Um, as far as good guy kills, and actually, I don't know if you would really consider this a good guy kill or a bad guy kill. It's kind of on your based on your political beliefs, but uh, General Orloff got shot in the back many times by uh, the German Democratic Republican Guards. So I guess it just depends on your, your point of view as if that was a good guy kill or a bad guy kill. And then the rest of the kills were all Bond. He uh, he killed Toro and Toro's men in the warehouse. He killed that assassin on the bed of nails. He threw that one guy into the tank where the octopus he covered his face and poisoned him. And I don't know if this is really a Bond kill. To I don't know if it was octopusy. He was an octopus. But no, 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 no. It, it, it wasn't like octopusy wrapped herself around his face and killed him. It just sucked it out of him. There was a reference there with all eight of her tentacles. So the yo-yo saw man, how did he die? Did he drown? Did Bond kill him? Was there an alligator in the water? Did, did you guys... Did you catch that? I, I took it. The, the guy that he falls into the water with, an octopus, he thinks he dies, that Bond dies from being eaten by an alligator right outside her room or whatever. Okay. I always took it that there was really an alligator and it killed the bad guy and then Bond got away in his little alligator boat. Oh, okay. That was yeah. my interpretation. Okay. There, there, to me, it was unclear, but I'll, I'll go with you guys on that. Mishka got hit on the head and killed with the cannon. There was a Russian soldier who uh, was shot in the train car. Grishka got a knife in the stomach. Gobinda, who uh, was one of my favorite villains, actually, got an antenna to the face and then fell off the plane. And Kamal Khan, Star Trek Wrath of Kamal Khan, uh, his plane crashed into a mountain before Spock uh, terraformed it. So I am giving Bond nine confirmed kills plus all of Toro's men in the in the warehouse and then your obligatory castle onslaught killing the notch. Yeah, but I don't, Bond doesn't really Oh no, he does when he slides and down he, the he, banister. Yeah, he takes a couple out. And oh, that's an action scene we should have uh mentioned uh Matt oh, where he yeah. slides down the banister and shoots the end of the stairs off so uh his boys have some time for octopusy at the end. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure they just cleverly edited out the um, little stair machine that he was riding down the whole time. <laughs> That's probably true. Q rigged that thing to go much faster. Matt, any kill sequences that you thought were entertaining or a, a, a kill that stood out to you? The banister sequence was um, was delightfully absurd, especially when he has to shoot off the, the knob at the end there. You know, I thought the knife to the gut was, was a little... Um, and it stood out to me for being a little uh, shocking, just based on how most of the violence was kind of. You're talking fairly, about about the twin too. Yeah, it, most of the violence was fairly benign, and then there was that one with the big, the big, heavy knife to the gut. That one definitely kind of stood out. Not not necessarily for being particularly clever or anything, but for kind of being a little uh, a cold? little violent compared cold. to the rest of the movie. But a little cold well, too. Also compare that to the previous film where he didn't want to kick the one villain off the the side of the cliff while he was in the car because he didn't think that was very Bond-esque. And then for this film, he had no problem with the knife in the stomach. Uh, Chris, any kill scenes that you liked? Well, no, they all kind of just kind of blended together. I, I will say that although Matt didn't like the beginning of the film, I did like the way that Bond was able to blow up Toro and the whole warehouse because you think his mission's a failure because he was trying to blow up whatever that thing was inside the plane or whatever and then gets caught. But he ends up completing his mission and taking out all the bad guys. So I, I did like it, but it wasn't you know, it wasn't like the best of the Bond scenes, sequences. You know, I, I'm going to agree with Chris a little bit on that. Is that I don't. There's not a, a really like a good 
scene kill scene that really stands out to me in this like unlike some of the other bond films they kind of blur together uh, in fact i always forget how kamal khan die every time i watch this i always forget is, is this the one where there's a plane at the very end and and i always get it confused with like the plane sequence at the very end of living Di- daylights so it it does kind of blur together a little bit but let's talk about villains because there seems to be a shit ton of them in this film <laughs> That we Too have, many. Yeah, we have Kamal Khan, who I would say is the A-list, the big bad guy in this particular film, played by our favorite pedophile from Gigi, Louis Jor- Louise Jordan, or Louis Jordan. Where's Lori when we need her to discuss? And, of course, uh, what film with Louis Jordan would not be complete with lots of young girls around? And we have lots of them in this. They're all too old for a park, though. That that's true. Uh, what did you guys think of him as the big bad in this? In general, I liked him. I mean, he didn't really have a whole lot of personality, but I did see him as coming off as a ruthless villain. I still think that they named him after Star Trek II: Wrath of Khan just to kind of cash in on some some villainous name recognition. But overall, I think he did a sufficient job. Nothing outstanding, but, you know, sufficient. Uh, They should have combined his character with maybe um, General Orlov's, you know. But other than that, he he did good. I I liked uh, Kamal as um, the villain quite a bit. And, in fact, he kind of reminds me of... um is it uh, Ricardo Ricardo Montalban's um, villain from The Naked Gun? Yes, I I thought I, I mean I don't think anyone deliberately made any any you know I don't think in The Naked Gun they were playing on that at all, but it's just kind of reminding me of one of my favorite villains from one of my favorite movies, the way he kind of played it a little more um, a little more understated, you know a little more business like a little more realistic, and I just I just kind of enjoyed that about him. He just kind of seemed more like a, a real guy than a than a cartoonish supervillain. So he was one of my favorite Bond villains. As far as villains go, I really like him. I think he's very interesting on the sc- screen. He's not chewing up scenery. I, I like the, the kind of conversations he has with Bond, uh, specifically like when he has Bond for dinner and they, Bond's talking about how what torture he's going to do to him. And he's actually just calmly eating dinner and explaining, oh, no, the, we find that uh, unreliable. You know, uh, we try this and, and I think that's actually very sinister. It's, it's very frightening to think of him just calmly explaining how he's going to uh, make, you know, he's going to administer a drug that would ultimately make Bond psychotic, but to, to, you know, garner the information that they're looking for. And, and he's very obvious in that he wants to kill Bond because every time he sees him, He's making veiled threats to him, but he does it in a very calm way. He doesn't go over the top, and he—it's it, very the subtleness of his performance. I think makes him one of the more sinister Bond villains in quite some time that we've seen. But uh, a good lead villain has some good henchmen, and he has a good henchman in Gobinda, played by Kabir Badi. What did you think? I, I think Chris already said that Gobinda is one of his favorite Bond henchmen. Yeah, yeah, I think he's he's the strong silent type and he doesn't really play it for laughs in this film uh, unlike the rest of the film. So I, I think he was a very strong, solid henchman. He didn't come off as stupid or goofy. And the only time that you kind of saw him break that character was in the absurd plane scene where Khan tells him to go take care of Bond outside of the plane because he's thinking the exact same thing of me. Like, what are you, stupid? I'm not going out on the outside of the plane, but uh, I, I I did like him a lot in this. I, I thought he was was forgettable. I really wanted him to lift up that hat and pull a weapon out on him under there at some point, and he never did. And I can't forgive him for it. But the yo-yo um, turban, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean the strong the strong silent type to me is, is is easy to do. I feel like you know the henchman. I, I kind of appreciate something a little more eccentric. You know, he he was just kind of kind of there for me yeah i'm gonna agree with matt that i find him kind of blah he he didn't really add much i didn't find him really sinister he seems to get uh, easily overtaken by bond on a, a couple of different occasions or bond gets his goat in one way or the other so I, I i find him a little bit unremarkable in the role but then there's 
what is referred to in IMDb, IMDb as Twin 1 and Twin 2, uh, played by Anthony and David Meyer, which I never under, really quite understood if they were Mishka and – what was the other one, Chris? Mishka and Grishka is Grishka. Um, what it sounded like in the film. It sounds like, but they're not identified that on IMDb, which was kind of interesting. But actually played by twins, Anthony and David Meyer. What did you guys think about the twin henchmen? They're all right. I mean, they they had a little bit of that um, eccentric touch to them, but they, I mean, they weren't a big part of the movie. They didn't add a, a lot to the movie, so they were they were a good touch for their limited role. This is kind of getting ahead about what doesn't work about the film, but I kind of felt like there was so much in this film that there were almost two full sets of villains in this, and I think that if you would have taken the twins out and put them in a different movie where they were the main bad guys or the main henchmen they would have been much much better but like matt said they they were good for what they were well i thought they were used very effectively in the i don't want to say the opening sequence but the sequence following uh, the first sequence after the uh, credit sequence where they're chasing 009 and he's surprised when he see, he, he's running from one and then runs into the other that I thought that was very very good use for dramatic effect, but I think they squandered it after that because pretty much the next time you see him, one of them gets killed right away with, with uh, like a ridiculous death with the you know the cannon fall, you know landing on his head. It was a Tom and Jerry ending. Uh, yeah, and and then the other guy, you know, th- there's a good you know there's the good stabbing sequence, but when he's by himself he's less threatening you know i think bond stands a chance at him so i I didn't find him a very intimidating villain but outside of the twins there is one villain is it general orloff or colonel orloff that general he's a general he's a general that as much as kamal is subdued i believe orloff is so over the top almost every time he's on the screen played by uh steven burkoff who's plays a lot of bad guys and villains uh Chris, what did you think of General or- Orloff? He was the Russian virgin- version of uh, George C. Scott in um, Dr. Strangelove, really. I mean, he was just the Russian version. And um, once again, I think there was two sets of villains, and I don't know if this was just an excellent misdirection on the, the movie Octopussy, or they just threw too much in this film, but... The beginning of the film, he was good. At the end of the film, he was over the top and annoying. Yeah, he was kind of over the top. He, I mean, he had a, you know, kind of a more interesting or, or more realistic motive, and so I, I, I kind of appreciated that. But again, for the most part, you know, he, not nothing, nothing too remarkable. Probably nothing I'd remember much, except for the fact that he kind of has that, um, that more realistic aspect to him i agree with it that it, at least this brought it back to like something the spy a spy would be going after is trying to find out what the the russian general is doing the one thing that bothered me about his character is i never quite understood why he's chasing the train so much at the end of the film and e- you know even trying to go into west germany is that he seems to break character so so much at that point in time that uh and he, he he seems to be panicking when he doesn't need to, and it just seems unnecessary. It was like, we got to wrap up this character somehow. This is the only way we can eliminate this character, because he's not going to be around anything at the end. You know, He's not going to be in West Germany for Bond to, to get him. He's not going to be back at the palace to get him, you know, for him to get him there. So that's how they wrote off the character, to, you know, to have some just desserts for him. Yeah, I feel like a, a few of these villains, they didn't really have a, a solid way to end them and just kind of half-assed it. They just dropped a, a cannon on top of their head? Just- yeah, they they didn't know whether to kill them off with the jewelry or the bomb, and in the end, it failed. And the last one I had as a villain is uh, Magda, because Magda is actually actively working for Kamal Khan. I mean, she's working with him. To acquire, to reacquire the actual egg, the Fabergé egg. And she's, even at one point, although I think she's not trying to mislead uh, Octopussy, is telling Octopussy that, you know, Bond's going to ruin the entire plan. So I, I honestly think she's, I put, I classify her more as a villain than good guy. No, I agree with that completely. I, I always saw her as a villain in this. And I still hate her, though. 
Although, although she was redeemed because once she saw that Kamal Khan was just going to blow her skinny ass up, then she came back and led the fake prostitutes to distract the guards so they could take the, retake the palace. Fake prostitutes, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I guess, and she doesn't strike me as being so much of a villain because she seemed. I mean, the octopusy smuggling ring seemed pretty benign to me, didn't it? And it was kind of Kamal who was the one who was a little more dangerous and scheming. Octopusy kept saving Bond's life. She seemed to have uh, be kind of noble, but then um, Magda just seemed like she wasn't like the murderous type of villain she's just a little more of the criminal underworld type that that maybe not an, an upstanding person wasn't really wasn't really gonna you know um chop you in half with a laser beam and feed you to alligators or something like that i don't true. know true and there's a couple of points in time where like when bond gets out of his room she's aware of it and she doesn't raise the alarm so but she's not she's not working with bond but she's not you know she's sometimes works against him so that's she seemed like, you know, smuggling jewels was probably the worst thing she was caught up in, really. That and sleeping with an elderly gentleman from England at one point in time, so. Well, that crime carries its own punishment with <laughs> that's, it. That's true. I smell like mothballs. Um, <laughs> that stuff must not come out with a couple washings. <laughs> like, it smelled like Ben Gay the entire time. I don't know what it is. It's always stretching. All right, what ultimately works about the film Octopussy? I I think the the plot works in that it's a little more understated. Uh it's a little more it's a little more realistic. I think the soundtrack works. I liked I liked the the more um orchestra type music through the movie. Yeah. Well, I think the humor works in this film, I, I did like this, even though some of them were a bit contrived, sure. I think overall, this had some very good lines, and it did keep me entertained for most of it. Uh, we'll get into that uh, for the next section, what doesn't work about the film. But overall, you know, it it was an entertaining film, even though there's some implausibilities in this one. You know, Octopussy is kind of this anomaly to the James Bond series, is that it it falls into a, a lot of the things I do like is a, a much more realistic down to earth plot following along the lines of for your eyes only. It's not a, it's not so much. I'm an evil villain going to take over the world. There's, there's some complexity to the storyline that I like is it. It's not so obvious of what anyone's trying to do. And as far as the, the plot from Orloff and Kamal Khan and concerning the jewels that octopus he's trying to smuggle. So, I like that it's a you ha it's a little bit more I would I almost describe it as cerebral is that it's not so obvious it's a it's a little bit more difficult to follow I, I agree I like the soundtrack I like I like Louis Jordan in the film as a villain he's I don't want to say he's one of my favorite villains but I think he works in the role and he's he's different from a lot of the other main bad guys from some of the other James Bond films but what doesn't work about this film well. There's just too much. I think there's too much plot and there's too many villains. And if they would have pared back a little, you know, edited this uh, film down, it would have been much more solid. I, I like the overall theme of a Soviet general going rogue. I thought that alone could have been its own movie. These jewel thieves uh, in the underworld could have been its own movie and they just threw it all together. So that's really what didn't work for me. And I think that's what kept this from being an outstanding movie. Roger Moore didn't work anymore. <laughs> he he literally he, didn't. I mean, it was like stunt doubles the entire time. He was he was too old and the girls were not very attractive, um the at least the ones in the lead roles. Those those two things just just didn't work. Yeah, I, my biggest complaint is Roger Moore as Roger uh, as James Bond. Uh, he's he's just far too old for the role at this point in time. Uh, it's interesting doing the research for this film how that they had looked to recast the role because after Roger Moore did the first three films, after that he was on a film by film basis. If he didn't want to come back, he didn't have to, and he had really considered not returning to the role. 
um, and they had looked at Timothy Dalton and actually screen tested James Brolin uh, for the role. And then it was announced that Sean Connery was doing Never Say Never Again, and they felt they really needed they 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 needed someone they needed Roger Moore. They needed an established Bond to go against you know basically the summer of James Bond films um, with Connery's Never Say Never Again. So they really went after him to, to and got him to come back for a sixth time, which tied him with Connery in the official James Bond series, but not total films. So it was it, it it really takes away from the film especially now as a kid it didn't distract me as much but now as an adult it's just like every time there's any kind of remote action sequence bond is or Roger Moore is being replaced by a stunt double and it looks so obviously like a stunt double and you know you might as well when he's in bed with Magda to throw in a stunt double in there because I didn't find that believable either and it just it it just be, it becomes too distracting. The one saving grace I will say is because they had Maude Adams as a much older Bond girl, which I'm not, and I'm not against older Bond girls. I think age appropriate is probably a way to go because I, I find it distracting when there's too much of an age difference. A la the next film uh, uh, with Roger Moore of You to a Kill and Tanya Roberts, that I just like uh, talk about robbing the cradle. Uh, it just just is so out of place. But yeah, that that. To me, that begins and ends right there. Is I, I don't, I don't think Roger Moore should have done this film. I think they should have gone a different direction. I will put a note that Entertainment Weekly chose uh, Octopussy as the third worst James Bond film. Norman uh, Milner Wilner of MSN chose it as the eighth worst, and IGN uh, chose it as the seventh worst James Bond film. So there's a lot of people who do not think that Octopussy is a good film, but. Uh, where would you put it in your James Bond films? Uh, at this point in time, I know we're not ranking them uh, from top to bottom, but would you put it in your top half, your bottom half? And, and ultimately, did you like the film or enjoy the film? You know, it was it was okay. It was absurd a lot of the time. But I would put it definitely in the top half of Roger Moore Bond movies and probably sneak it just into the top half of Bond movies that we've seen. I'm going to agree with Matt. I've always liked this film. Even though it has um, its faults, uh, is, this is another one that is from my childhood. But I actually don't think nostalgia has that much to play in this one. I I do like the comedy in this. I think it works very well. Uh, some it, it's a little bit quieter, and some of the action scenes are are just are, aren't your normal big time explosions of the other bonds we've seen. But this film has always worked for me, and I will put it in my top 40% of what we've seen so far. Wow, Chris gets real specific with the 40%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I yeah, would, well, yeah, go ahead. No, I would probably put it in the top half of the films we've seen so far. I think Octopussy gets a bad rap. And, and kind of what I said before is that it's this weird anomaly that some people really, really like it, and some people really, really hate it. And I... I agree with Matt. I think it's in the top half of the Roger Moore films is, and Roger Moore has got some bad films. And I know that's not saying much uh, as compared to a lot of the Sean Connery films, but I think this is as good as, if not better than diamonds are forever or honor majesty secret service that I, I like this film and enjoy it better for what it is, which is, is a pared down, not over the top James Bond film, which are the ones that I tend to like the best. It's better than Goldfinger. Just kidding. Oh, yeah. You're going to piss a lot of people off by saying that. But no, I do not consider it better than Goldfinger. But I do think it it gets an unfair rap that uh, there are problems with the film. Yes. But I don't think it's as it's as bad as a lot of people, you know, remember it or think of it as it's not great, but it's pretty good Roger Moore bond. If you're going to watch a Roger Moore. And once again, I may be like Chris, uh, you know, being very reminiscing about this film because it was on the HBO loop all the time when I was a kid. I watched it so many times when I was younger. It was just this and For Your Eyes Only and eventually A View to a Kill came on all the time. 
All right, that does it for this month's review of Octopussy. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun that doesn't have to stop here, you can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories, or on Twitter at MH Memories, or on Google Plus at Movie House Memories. On either Facebook, Twitter, or um, Google Plus, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on either Mail Bonding, Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, or The Number Two Review. All podcasts are available through the MHM Podcast Network. Additionally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off iTunes, make sure to rate our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we get from any listeners of the show. All right, that does it for this episode of Octopussy. Next month, we review the other 1983 James Bond film, the final film with Sean Connery, Never Say Never Again, or what we like to refer to as Thunderball two until next time i'm patrick i'm chris and i'm at and we'll see you all next time at our house this podcast is not endorsed by eon productions or sony pictures and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only james bond and octopussy all names and sounds of james bond and octopussy characters and any other james bond and octopussy related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of eon productions and sony pictures or their respective trademark and or copyright holders all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of movie house memories and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise noted